that area of scripture, especially there in Matthew, I mean, it's just an awe. Um, the text that has been read this morning dealing with those that believe. And, and uh, here in Matthew, that text that was just read deals with very close to where we're going to be at here in John chapter 4. If you remember last week, John chapter 4, we talked about the belief a woman had. The woman at the well, she not only took her belief and the knowledge that she knew, but she met the Savior face to face. Remember last week? And the things that he spoke to her just ripped through her. It was mind-blowing. I was talking about last week. And what did she do? She dropped her pot and immediately ran to the city and started to have a testimony, started to testify, started to speak about what was told to her, start to speak about. She believed that she had met the Messiah. She had met the Christ that she knew was coming, someone who was going to reveal everything to her. Remember the excitement that just ripped through her, and she she just started telling everyone. And now we are still in chapter 4, and we're going to meet, a, we're going to meet another individual that has a, a, a faith that is stirred up, a belief that is stirred up, and he too has a testimony. John chapter 4. We're going to start, and I'm going to read verses 43 through 54. At the end of two days, you remember how we ended it last week. He's, they begged him, Jesus, stay here. And so Jesus stayed for two days at that area of the woman at the well. Stayed there two days, and people came to know him and continued to believe in him. Well, here we are. At the end of two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. Wow, just what we heard in Matthew. Yet the Galileans welcomed him. For they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum and heal his son who's about to die. Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better. And they replied, Yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming to, from Judea. Let's pray for a moment. God, I just thank you for um, the testimonies that we are hearing just very quickly within in your word. Something that takes place in the life of an individual and words that are spoken. God, this hour, we ask your Holy Spirit to reveal what you have for us how our lives can be a living testimony for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we have Jesus, who's now in Cana. He had left the woman at the wells town, and he had traveled through Galilee to this town of Cana. And at the same time in this story, we have a government official. We have one who is high up in the rankings. We have one who, who is known, one who holds a, a title. And his kid is sick and dying. And I hope you guys are grasping when I'm talking about this testimony of belief. Something has to take place within these surroundings. 
because Capernaum is about 15 to 20 miles away from Cana. And somehow this man has heard, and I know it's not like today, text, 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 text. Did you hear who's going to Cana? It's Jesus. No. Or you didn't go, bring, bring. Did you hear who's going? Or let's go even further, you know, with the string and the can. Did you hear who's going to Cana? Jesus, the one who performs. And we know the miraculous things that he does because he turned water into wine. Wow, yeah, I remember that. And I'm sure there was other things that Jesus is, as he is walking and talking, that the, the word just started rocketing through. And 15 to 20 miles away, a man hears that the one who, who performs miracles, the one who, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if in those two days that this woman testifying about a man who is called the Christ, one who's the Messiah. I'm wondering if that word made it to Capernaum. And now we know that the Messiah is amongst us, one who not is just a miracle worker, but he is the, the Savior. Did that word get to him? What made him stop spending his money on doctors Stop trying to bring in whoever could fix his son and heal his son to leave his dying son and walk or trot or however he made that trek to see the one who something inside him said, only you can heal my dying son. He comes up to Jesus. And in the scripture text that we read in John, there is an urgency in his voice. I need you to come and heal my son. I need you, can you, I need you, Jesus, to quit doing what you're doing. I know you made a beeline. I know you're traveling here. I need you to quit doing that. And I need you to get on the horse or get on a donkey or get on a cart. Or I need you to come with me because my son is dying. And Jesus, there is a lot in this text. And people take it all kinds of different ways. And here's my, my, my path on it, is the testimony of the, of the man. Because Jesus looks at him and looks around at the crowd of people that's probably following him. And he says, what's, and this is my paraphrase, what's up with you people? You will not believe in me unless you see a miraculous sign or a wonder. If, unless I pull something out of the hat and do something, you won't believe in me unless I do that. And I, I, can't, I can't comprehend. It's hard for me to grasp. What, what? Well, Jesus, why would you say that? I mean, the guy's son is sick. And we know that you can do things. And maybe that's the point of it. Maybe there's too many people that are trying to surround Jesus, even today, trying to surround Jesus to see what is he going to pull out of his hat. And let's get greedy with it, because the only times that we want to surround Jesus sometimes is to see what he's going to pull out of his hat for me. Whew! Miraculous and miracle and, and sign-like, and it's for me. That's what I'm waiting for. That's why I'm going to stand in line with the Master. Yeah, I know he's the Messiah. I know he's the Christ, and I know what he can do, so I'm going to wait my turn. Maybe that's why Jesus said it. All I know is this. Right after he said it, that urgency... That deep down desire was still in this man's heart and it just comes, comes out where after Jesus said that miraculous sign, said, the, the official guy, he comes up to him and he still pleads with the master, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. You know what I love about that right there? 
this is what I'm grasping from this, is yes, here's one who can perform miraculous signs and wonders. Here's one who can turn water into wine. Here is one who is obviously the Savior. Here is one who is obviously the Messiah. Here is one who is the Christ that they've been talking about coming. Here is the one that is going to change the world. And yes, I'm sure he can pull something out of the hat right here for everybody. But you know what? None of that matters. I'm not looking for a miraculous sign. I'm not looking for a miracle to be performed right here so people can believe. All I care about is you coming and saving my dying son. Wow. It's not about him. Not really. It's about a life that he cares for. A life that he wants to live and grow up. It, I mean, some of us will twist and go, yeah, it's all about him and his son. No, it's not. There's something in his words where Jesus then looks down through this man's soul and he sees someone who's not standing in line waiting for something to be pulled out of the hat just for him. He sees a man who has this belief, a man who has this faith, a man who must know something about the man he's standing before as Savior, as one who could probably heal his son. There's something there that surpasses just trying to see a miracle, and there's this thing that is right there before him. And Jesus looks at him. And even though Everyone else might be standing around looking for this miracle. In fact, think about it. He just, he just made this massive statement. You will not believe unless you see a miracle. And then you have this man who still turns right back around and pleads that his dying son be healed. Can you imagine? Because there's probably someone standing there going, here we go. We're going to see something big. It's going to be a big miracle because we got a kid dying. God, this man's going to do, God's going to do something with this man. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to see it. There was nothing to see. Well, unless you looked at the man. Because Jesus made a simple statement. Go your way. Your son lives. I'm going to pause there for a moment because something just kind of hits me. You know, I mean, I, I love because I know what happens. <laughs> That's the good thing about reading your scriptures. You know what the end result is, okay? I know the boy's going to live. First of all, Jesus said he lives. <laughs> but there's something he says, go your way. Your son lives. And, and I'm not going to try and detail it out. I'm just going to tell you how it, it says to me. This is what it says to me. The father came with this belief in the Messiah. This father came with this belief that, 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 that this man, this Savior, could do something that would bring life to his son. And there was something about his trust. There was something about leaving his son to see this man. There was something about his action. There was something about him needing to connect up with the Savior. And Jesus says, go your way, which me, it, to me says this. The same thing you had when you came to me. You take that back home to your son that lives. That should be for us today. Those of us that are not looking for that thing pulled out of the hat. Those of us that are standing before the Savior saying, you know what, God, whatever it is you have for me, that's what I want. And I come to you and I stand before you and I ask you to pour it over me so that I can have a testimony, so that I can tell someone, so that I can show someone you. Let me have that. That's what I want. And I'm going to come to you with that thought, that that desire, that heart. And I want you, God, to say this to me. Go your way. You have it. I want you to leave this prayer. Stand up and know that the same thing you came and desired is the same thing you walk away with, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Go your way. Your son lives. The man's awesome. I, I, I love the examples in the Bible. Because the man takes Jesus at his word. He hears what Jesus says. In, 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 and Jesus in, in, in 40, excuse me, 50 says, go, your, go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. 
Uh, can you see the effect? Can you see what just happened? Your son will live. Go home. Keep doing what you're doing. I want you to take what you now have and go back home. Your son lives. And he starts to walk away from that crowd. He starts to walk away from that master and head back for home, just as he said. He's not like some of them that are still standing around looking. Did you see? Did, did I blink? Did I miss that miracle? Because I didn't see nothing happen. No, he took Jesus at his word. And he walked away and started going back home. He has this prime example. While some stood looking for what was to be pulled out of the hat, the man in his heart said, I don't need any proof. I don't need some lightning bolt coming down, going right in the, in the dirt. Your son lives. Kaboom! I don't need none of that. I don't need where an angelic host comes out and says, yes, the Savior has spoken this one simple line, go your way, your son lives. I don't need none of that. All I need is what the Master said, and I'm going my way. He doesn't question Jesus. Well, Jesus, are you sure about this? Do I need to pick up anything at the pharmacy on the way home? What do I need to do? He doesn't question anything. He moves on with the mere words of the Savior, which is good enough for him. Are the mere words of the Savior good enough for you? This official, he has shown us this connection that he has, this relationship that he has. He, he goes from this knowledge of the one that's the Savior to a connection. It has to be a connection. How, can, how, else can you, how else can you explain walking away at the mere words, your son will live? There has to be this connection. There has to be this relationship. There was something that happened between the two of them as they stood face to face where he knew what his relationship was as he walks away. His servants in this story they come out to meet him. And like I said, 20, almost 20 miles away. And so you have this, this traveling time. And has anybody ever walked a marathon? 26 miles? Has anybody ever run a marathon? Ouch. <laughs> uh, in less than two hours? Whatever the record is. <laughs> it, it takes time to travel that distance. And as they're trying, I, I, I almost wish I could have been there with as he's walking back. Can you just see the, man, I can't, I can't wait to get back home. Some of us know what it's like, you know, when you're away for so long. There's, there's something about getting back with family sometimes. Sometimes it's the opposite, right, Mark? Where you want to just leave family after a while. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's my house. No, <laughs> kidding again. Some of you guys are like, I know what he's talking about, though. No, but there's this thing. He just wanted to get back. So he's traveling back. And as he's traveling back, there's something that takes place in his house. And here's some of it. This is how I comprehend it. We have a kid who is so deathly sick, going to die. And his father, as a last resort, leaves his dying son for the last hope that there is. And he must have, there had to have been something said in the house that there's a possibility that there's one who will come and he'll, 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 he may lay his hands on my son and heal him. He might pour oil on him and heal him. He might do whatever and heal him. But I'm going to go to that last resort. So you guys, watch after my son while I go. I'm just going to about a day's journey maybe. Just about 20 miles. And I'll hook up with him. And I will bring him back. Well, when he didn't come back that night. And the words take place, your son lives. And in the scripture text we read that his son was healed at the time Jesus said it. They're sitting there. And you gotta, you gotta fathom it. Here's this dying boy, and like, like, <laughs> I can only explain it this way: someone who's fooling you. 
I'm sick. I'm not going to school. Ooh, but man, now it's nice out. Let's go outside and play. The boy has to probably jumps up. He probably gets excited. He shows that the fever is gone like any boy would. And there's a change in him. And these guys who know the master's heart is ripped decide we know where he's at. We got to go tell him. He can come home. He don't even have to waste the master's time. We can go and get him healed and so they're coming out to meet him and they meet face to face and here is this testimony of belief the servant's excited I, and I would be too because one thing is brownie points right there you know what I'm talking about I'm gonna be the first one to tell him, man, boys all right Woohoo! thank you thank you and so they race out and they tell him how his son's living and right away the official asked, well, wh when did this take place? And the scripture says he starts to connect. That they say it took place, and, and there's your versions that give you these technical times. And it's about 1 o'clock in the afternoon that his son is immediately healed. And it says, the fever left him. And the man sits there and goes, he realizes that is the exact hour that Jesus spoke that simple phrase, your son will live. Now, John, John's really, I, I don't understand this part because John is so almost technical. He tells you the time of day. He tells you the distance of the, or, or the, which towns they are at so you know the distance. He tells you what has taken place two days after or two days before with the woman at the well. He's telling you this and he's telling you that and he's being very specific but he doesn't really say what happened. What he says is their whole house believed. He jumps from the man, and I could just see, you want to talk about a lightning bolt, it had to just have ripped through him. And his, 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 his belief, stronger, knowing he met the one that healed him. His faith, stronger and, 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 and broader. And I can't explain it because your faith is just this faith thing. But there's something about you inside that just builds up with a boldness. And that, maybe that's what it is. Maybe there's this boldness that just ripped up through him. Wow. I know and met face to face the man that did this. And, it, and then John goes, and the whole household believed. So here's, here's my take. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put something in between those dots right there. And this is what I think happened. I think he began to tell them, I met the Savior. And I met this man, and, 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 and well, everyone, and he even talked about miracles and signs and how these people believe. But I believe beyond that, without that. And he said this one thing, go your way, your son lives. That's all he did. And look what happened. The time that he said that, he's healed. Can you believe it? And all of a sudden, there was something in his testimony. There was something in what he was saying as they walked back to that house. There was something as they sat around the table eating dinner. There was something that took place probably after that when he went to work. Because John don't go into details. But I'm telling you, if that testimony, testimony affected his household, it affected his where he worked. It affected what surrounded him because it became who he was. He had met the healer. And his whole house believed. His faith was confirmed. His life was transformed. And in his testimony, lives that surrounded him were transformed. We're going to get ready to, to close out the service and, and, and have a, a time of, of communion. And as I was preparing this, this, this week and knowing that communion was coming, for me, communion especially, it, is, it deals with, for me, and, and uh, there's, there's areas of scripture that, we're, that we go to a lot of times for communion. Um, uh, the one we usually go to is second, uh, excuse me, First Corinthians chapter eleven, and uh, in that, actually, uh, that's being taught is these people are doing communion wrong, and, and they're looking at the Lord's Supper wrong, 
And there's a great teaching that goes into it. And, and so then I started thinking, you know what? what? What's being said in Corinthians is we need to transform our thought process on how we look at the Lord's Supper. It's not just sit down and eat. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, some of them were like, I'm going to make sure I eat first because it's all about me. And skip out on the poor people. And the teaching comes in. That's not even what it's about. In fact, actually, you start, should start looking at how you're treating the poor people. You should start looking at how you're treating the things that are, are surrounding your life. Your life needs to be transformed. And so then when the time comes to take communion, it is a transformed life. One that has been changed. One that has been affected by standing face to face with the Savior. One that knows that He died on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven. So that you could, with the work of the Holy Spirit, Live a holy life so that you can live different than the way the world lives. So that people could look at you and they, they see something that is not just a miracle following you, but they see a changed life that has been changed by what? And then all of a sudden, in that transform transformation, words come out about your belief. Words come about how you've been changed. And you can talk about the one who died on the cross and saved you. And brought you into a... See, that's the thing. I can't just stop there. Brought you into a relationship with God. A relationship. So that you're transformed and others can see it. So then when we take communion, it is a reminder of God dying on the cross for us. It is a reminder that He bore his, shed His blood so that we could be whiter than snow. Pure. Holy. <laughs> sinless. Yet in this time, I'm going to go in an area of Scripture that is in Matthew, when Jesus actually sits down with His disciples. And, and it, it, in Matthew, it's a cool area of Scripture because it's um, the Passover. And He tells them where to go and prepare this room for them. And it talks about, it, it, and it's a hard area of Scripture there too. Because in this area of Scripture, Jesus sits down and during the, this long meal time, He actually just before He is breaking bread and, and drinking of the, the wine with His disciples and having communion with them for Passover, or I call it communion, but when they're doing celebrating this Passover, there's one that He says out loud, one's going to betray me. And He goes into detail. It's one who dips his hand in the cup. Wow. Yet, even in that, there are lives that are transformed because they're sitting there with the Savior. And even as they question certain things about what's about to take place and, 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 and struggle with it, Jesus comes out with this breaking of bread, this new covenant with His blood, so that we can have a relationship with Him. I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. We're going to sing a song before we go into communion. And as usual, um, Pastor Mark and I will stand down there and, and one side can come up. You can uh, take of the, the, uh, the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus. You can partake of the wafer, which represents the, the broken body of Jesus. And then take it back to the pews and then we'll take uh, communion together while reading scripture. But as we get ready to stand for this song, I would ask this. Um, it is about a transformed life. So if you don't have that relationship with God, um, during the song, if you would like to come forward and pray at the altars, I'll pray with you. God can transform you. He can change you. He can um, forgive you. Let's start there. He can forgive you with that relationship with Him started. There's those of us as we're singing. I'll ask this. Take a look at, at your testimony. Take a look at your transformed life. Are those around you being transformed because you've met the Savior and they come to believe in Him? You remember last week, um, I, what I liked about last week is when, the, when they rushed out and they had Jesus sit with them for two days, hit, their words of the people were, you know what? 
woman, we, I'm sure it was probably went this way. Woman, we love you, man, because you, you have brought the Savior to our attention. You testified. You told us all this about him that just stirred our hearts. But it's more than what you said. It's because we've heard from him. And we can still hear from him today, today. Through prayer, his word, and as he speaks through others. So I'm going to ask at this time, as we're singing, if you'd like to pray, you come and pray. And after you pray, we'll take communion.